So you may have heard of the term Protestant Buddhism. It's a description of a lot of contemporary approaches to Buddhist uh, belief and practice. What is it, and where did it, where did it come from? That's what we'll be discussing on today's video. Coming right up. So I'm Doug Smith. I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association. That's secularbuddhism.org. If you're interested in helping to promote a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled world, consider subscribing to the channel. So there's a feature of recent uh, Buddhist uh, belief and practice called uh, that's been described as Protestant Buddhism. Uh, it's a, a phrase that originated with uh, the Buddhist scholar Gananat Obeyesekere um, and was uh, elaborated in a book that he wrote uh, with Richard Gombrich, the eminent uh, Pali and, and early Buddhist scholar. Uh, you may, I don't know if you've seen it, you may have seen it, this is the book here, um, Buddhism Transformed. It's particularly about Buddhism in Sri Lanka, and that's where he, believe, he believes that uh, this kind of Buddhism sort of got its start. So first, let's look at the history uh, that led to Protestant Buddhism uh, arising as a sort of a, a way of thinking about, about, about Buddhism. Uh, it began with uh, the arrival of, of missionaries to Sri Lanka. It's, we're talking about in a context of coloni the colonial atmosphere. Uh, I believe it was the British who were in possession of Sri Lanka at that time. So these would have been uh, Western colonial powers uh, trying to introduce uh, Christianity to uh, the normally uh, Buddhist inhabitants of the island. And a lot of these were Protestant uh, Christians, and so from that, in that respect, they would have learned something of Protestant Christianity. Now, another aspect of this uh, colonial atmosphere was the sort of reformation of teaching uh, on the island at that time. So uh, up until then, uh, teaching had largely been in the hands of monastics and would have been in a monastic atmosphere, uh, presumably uh, learning about, about Buddhism, aspects of Buddhism, or learning about the world in sort of Buddhist terms. And the reformation of teaching led to uh, learning about the world in a more sort of Western traditional way of, of learning about the world. And in particular, it would have involved, all this was, would have been in the 19th century, learning some of the Western uh, understanding of the world in a sort of scientific sense. And these innovations would have been very unusual and new to the inhabitants of the island, the people learning in school. And it would have illuminated for them the fact that not all of knowledge was in possession of the Sangha, of the, the Sangha of monastics that had been teaching them up until then. In the same way that, that happened in Europe uh, many centuries earlier, back at the, at the end of the Middle Ages, when a lot of Greek and Roman learning got retranslated back into Latin that had been lost for many years and many centuries. It was translated back into Latin in Europe, and that caused a kind of reformation that eventually led to uh, the Renaissance uh, and the Enlightenment many uh, centuries later, because people began to be aware in Europe um, here I'm making the comparison. In Europe, people began to be aware that not all of uh, knowledge was, was contained in the Bible, that in fact the Greeks, uh, who were uh, not even believers in the book, they were, not, they were, they were pagans, um, that the Greeks had knowledge uh, of, the, of the natural world, knowledge of uh, or sort of a quasi-scientific nature that was not contained in the Bible. That was a revelation to many people who were Christians at the time. And here we find a sort of similar thing happening in Sri Lanka, at least according to Obeyesekere and, and Gombrich, that uh, sort of changed the, the outlook of people on the monastic Sangha. That is, that they were no longer the, the, the sole fount of knowledge. Also, they were new printings of the Pali Canon. In fact, uh, according to their book, uh, the Pali Canon had not been printed uh, until 1893 in Thailand. That is to say, until then, it would have existed only in handwritten manuscripts, so it would have been extremely rare, and not the sort of thing that any layperson really would ever expect to see in their lifetime, much less get to know. But as the, the Pali Canon became uh, printed and translated, uh, I believe first into English actually, sort of ironically, but many of the inhabitants of the island would have learned English, that as members of this bourgeoisie, uh, people of the upper middle class, people of the upper class, people who were learned, people who may have understood English or, or gotten to learn English or knew, knew English, 
would have read these texts, and that would have been something of a revelation as well, because up until that point, their only access to these texts would have been through um, monastic intermediaries if they got to know them at all in any respect. But now they could they could get to know them. So basically this all comes together as a, a widening the field of learning and knowledge to people on the island in a way that they hadn't had access to before. And that changed things uh, very radically. In particular, uh, we can think of uh, three ways, I would say, that it, it changed uh, the lay experience or the experience of the people on the island, householder experience of the Dharma. Uh, one of the ways is to basically a uh, privilege a uh, lay experience, lay practice, in a way that hadn't been done up until then. Secondly, it would have privileged a lay interpretation of the Dharma, which would not have been uh, the case up until then. Up until then, interpretations of the Dharma were pretty much exclusively in the hands of monastic uh, learners or uh, monastic teachers, uh, and, and the idea that a lay person could come to know the Dharma independently was really unknown. And third, as these texts became uh, more widely understood, more widely known, it privileged uh, access to and privileged understanding of the canonical texts. In other words, it, it, was, it was less that the monastics got to say how things were, and more that, that uh, lay people would go back to those original, those canonical texts, uh, original insofar as we know, and use those uh, basically to understand how they should practice Buddhism rather than going to a, a monk or a nun to tell them, actually there were no nuns at the time, so a monk to tell them uh, how to behave or how, how they should interact with Dharma. And there are various ways that these uh, related approaches really uh, echo what uh, Obeisekere and, and, and Gombrich find in Protestant Christianity, or at least the, the origins of the Protestant movement, which in sort of ironic ways came out also of this uh, newfound knowledge in Europe. And in particular, what they say, they, they say, uh, the essence of Protestantism, as we understand it, lies in the individual seeking his or her ultimate goal without intermediaries. Religion is privatized and internalized, the truly significant is not what takes place at a public celebration or in ritual, but what happens inside one's own mind or soul. And they, they term this uh, kind of view spiritual egalitarianism. It's a kind of leveling of the a distinction between lay people and monastics, between householders and monastics. Um, the idea being uh, that what counts is your own experience, your own knowledge, as you learn it yourself, either through meditative experience or through reading uh, and understanding of the Dharma, potentially through, through talking to monastics, but also through reading the actual texts themselves. And in the same way that this kind of Protestant Reformation or, or revolution in Europe changed uh, many Christians, uh, their views of, of Christian belief and practice, the same thing uh, or a similar thing happened as well in Sri Lanka and in Southeast Asia in the relation of the bourgeois, the middle class, upper middle class people towards uh, Buddhism. We can say that in many ways this is uh, part and parcel of the sort of uh, slow secularization of the Dharma. And this background led to certain developments. Uh, I'll, I'll pick out four developments in particular. The first is that Buddhism began to be thought of in more uh, rational or scientific terms. Uh, that is to say, instead of thinking of it as a group of, of practices or a group of rituals or in, in, in a very religious kind of light as a faith-based uh, practice, which it largely had become and was uh, for many, many centuries, millennia, as a, as a religion. Uh, now, many of the bourgeoisie, many of the believers in, in Sri Lanka tended to see it more as a rational enterprise, as something that you could uh, justify on its own terms, that didn't, you didn't need faith, that it was even a kind of science. The Buddha was thought of as being fully human, as opposed to being a sort of a quasi-supernatural kind of being, as he had become in the intervening centuries. And there was a, a de-emphasis of the sort of cosmological aspects of Buddhism and the ritual aspects of Buddhism that really were a large part of, of religious practice in the day and, and continue even in, in, in parts of the world uh, up until today. Uh, second, and in, in a related way, Buddhism was seen as now more of a philosophy uh, among these sort of Protestant Buddhist believers rather than as a religion. 
That is, as I've said, it was thought of as something rational, it was thought of as something that uh, was basically a kind of a form of thought, it was an approach to life, rather than uh, a kind of an all-encompassing sort of uh, religious uh, faith-based uh, group of, we might say, rituals and prayers and so on. Third, and in a related way, uh, there was the popularization of lay practice, in particular lay meditation. And this came out of Burma in particular. We, I've discussed this in prior videos. Uh, I'll try to put one up here on the screen where I discuss uh, the sort of origins of of secular or lay meditation uh, going back to uh, Burma and in particular Lady Sayadaw, his, his, inter his inventions, if you, if you will, of insight meditation. Uh, and that took over also in, in Sri Lanka as well. And finally, number four is a kind of, uh, they point to, uh, Obiasekara and, and Gombrich point to a kind of, I would say, growing or small but incipient sort of fundamentalist aspect to this uh, Protestant Buddhism. That is to say, a denigration of other forms of Buddhist belief and practice, a feeling that, that their own form of, of belief or practice was the highest, that uh, because it went back to the original text, that was the most, uh, the most correct, that other forms were not correct, both of Buddhism and other religions, other ways of believing. And so it led to a kind of ossification around a kind of fundamentalist attitude towards this approach. And I think it's this last aspect that goes the longest towards showing why the phrase Protestant Buddhism is often nowadays used as a pejorative uh, within Buddhist studies. Uh, nowadays, uh, it may be that if, if someone describes a particular interpretation as being a Protestant Buddhist interpretation, they're not, they're not trying to do it a favor. What they're trying to do is to, is to uh, denigrate it, basically. And part of the reason for that, I mean, there are many reasons, um, but part of the reason for that is that it was part of this Protestant Buddhist uh, approach that they sort of felt like they'd gotten it right. That is, that the Protestant Buddhism was quote-unquote true Buddhism. Uh, the Buddhism that, that went back to the original texts, that went back to uh, what they felt were the, original, the uh, correct interpretation of those original texts. Um, they felt that they were sort of uh, clearing out a bunch of ossification that had happened over the intervening centuries. And so it, it was an attempt, at least in many, uh, many, much of the way that the, the people at the time, and, and many people, let's be honest, even nowadays look at it, is that, that it was something that was more true than what was going on uh, in, in ordinary Buddhist practice, uh, ordinary religious Buddhist practice in Sri Lanka uh, in normal monasteries. And now that I've described what Protestant Buddhism, uh, where, it, where it arose from, uh, what it entailed, what it was, and what it sort of produced, the kinds of viewpoints it produced, I think we can all probably see ways that contemporary Buddhist belief and practice came out of that kind of background. And that a lot of what I discuss on this channel, or what you may hear from other places, either within a, an explicitly secular Buddhist context, or frankly, even within a, a mindfulness context, or a context of, of insight meditation, or in many, many different schools of Buddhism, you'll probably see aspects of what they term Protestant Buddhism, because it's, it's kind of infiltrated all of Buddhism. It's kind of a, a one of the roots of really what uh, constitutes in the West contemporary Buddhist uh, belief and practice, at least in a, in a large uh, group of, of practitioners. And, of course, there are good and bad aspects of this. I, I, I would like to get away from our using this term Protestant Buddhism as a, a kind of epithet, as a kind of uh, put-down. I think it's... I don't, I don't think Obeyasekere intended it that way, or at least in this book, it comes across as a relatively neutral term of description. And I think if we leave it as that, it's fine. Um, because it has good and bad aspects, or it has aspects that we can say are helpful and not helpful. Of course, the fundamentalist aspects are not so helpful. Insofar as we're grasping onto one particular uh, viewpoint and denigrating everybody else, I think we're probably not uh, being as kind as we could be, and maybe not as wise as we could be. It's also true that uh, from a, a scholarly perspective, there are aspects of this uh, approach which we can find in the canonical texts. There are other aspects that we cannot, in the sense that in the canonical texts there are certainly aspects of the Buddha where he was not portrayed as supernatural. I, mean, I should say not portrayed as a completely human uh, person. There are aspects where he is portrayed as supernatural. And we may think that those are probably later tack-ons, but they are part of the, the canon uh, taken if we take it as a whole.
And of course, there are many aspects that, that are not really completely consonant with our contemporary understanding of science. So if we're going to take uh, Buddhism as a really a scientific enterprise, we're really going to have to cherry pick. But as I say, there also are aspects that we do find in, in the ancient texts. Uh, and there's a reason why this kind of Protestant Buddhism, I think, caught on as well as it has. In one uh, review, in fact, of Obeya Sekere and Gombridge's book, uh, Vijita Rajapakse actually uh, points at this. And he says, um, early Buddhism's innovative critique of religion, defined in terms of rites performed by a priestly elite, its valuation of the vernacular and religious instruction, and above all, its doctrinal insistence that as regards spiritual liberation, each should be a lamp unto himself, taking refuge in none but the truth, the invocation of some parallel Christian positions evolved several centuries later to explain or account for Buddhist development seems quite odiose. And by odiose, he means uh, superfluous, unnecessary. In other words, we can find the roots for this uh, quote-unquote Protestant development within the early Buddhist texts themselves. Believers or people who were familiar with the Pali Canon would not have had to uh, rely on the Christian or Protestant formulation, the, the, the structure of Protestantism, in order to come to the kinds of advances they came to, or the, com the kinds of uh, intellectual developments they came to. Uh, because there are aspects of this kind of leveling within uh, the suttas. In fact, there are suttas which, in which lay people actually teach monastics. Uh, which lay people know the Dhamma better than monastics in certain respects, in certain contexts. So it was not un unheard of for there to be a more level, uh, at least in, in small corners here and there, even if we might say that in general, uh, the early texts do reflect a world in which the monastics were thought of as a separate Arya Sangha, the, the separate, uh, more a noble sangha of, of devotees. So while the Buddha himself, uh, if, we, if we look simply at the early texts, which is of course very hard to do, but let's, uh, let's try, the Buddha probably would not have been as much of a, a leveler as, as contemporary uh, secular practice would have it, or as uh, Protestant Buddhists many of them would have it. But the issue is complex, and it's not like we can answer this kind of question about whether this is uh, accurate of, of the early texts or not. And of course, we certainly can't answer the question about whether the early texts are real Buddhism. That's, a, that's an issue for each of us to decide. But even saying that, I'm taking a, something of a, a Protestant position, because uh, the traditional position is that it's really more of a monastic issue to decide, because it's the monastics who are really, in the, in the final analysis, in charge of the Dhamma. And that's, of course, a religious kind of approach, uh, rather than a secular one. But I think it does us good to understand where these uh, different approaches uh, stand in relation to each other and historically where they've come from. Because then as we move forward in attempting, as I say, to, to reach a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled kind of approach, when we're looking back at these texts to kind of influence and to uh, inform our approach, we have to understand our own history, at the very least in order to be more, uh, shall we say, humble about it. So I'd be interested to hear if you've come, on, uh, come upon this phrase, Protestant Buddhism, yourself. What's your feeling about it? Um, are you annoyed by the fact that it's, that it's usually used in a negative term? Do you think there's, it's worth, uh, as I say, just trying to think of it in a more uh, neutral, uh, kind of uh, historical, descriptive aspect? If you're interested in further discussion of these kinds of issues, uh, check out my Patreon page, a new Patreon page. So I hope this has been useful, and we will catch you in the next one of these videos. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.